Um, so I'm curious to know, can you tell us a little bit about where you live and where you work and um, just a little background about where you're at now? Sure. So we live in a little town called White River Junction, Vermont. It's in um, uh, central Vermont, right on the border of New Hampshire. So it's uh, the Connecticut River is the natural boundary between the two states. And we've lived here since 1986, um, raised our family here. Um, I went to college at Dartmouth uh, back in the 70s. And so now I teach at the school where I went to college. So um, we came back in 1986 when I was an administrator at the college. So I worked in student services. I had left being a, a lawyer. I was in private practice in New Orleans um, from about 83 to 86, uh, having gone to law school at Loyola in New Orleans. And, and so worked as a lawyer in private practice for three years. And then uh, my wife and I and our oldest daughter um, and then our son was uh, on the way. My wife was pregnant with him when we moved in 86. Um, so I worked in student services for about five years. And during that time, I began teaching as, a, as an adjunct professor. So it's not a full-time job. It's just kind of like a part-time gig. And I was teaching a course called Federal Indian Law, which deals with um, legal and policy relations between tribes, the states, and the federal government. And I began teaching that in 1987. And once I got in the classroom, I knew that I would never go back to being a, a regular lawyer. I just loved being a teacher. I love working with students. And so I did that um, on the side. I wasn't paid for that, actually. All that teaching I did for free for Dartmouth, but I was paid to be a um, student services professional. And then in 1991, I was offered a job uh, to be a law professor at Vermont Law School, which is just about a half hour from where we live. And so I took that job and uh, went into full-time teaching as a, at a law school for 17 years. Um, so I taught um, a variety of courses, including law that relates to Native people. And I expanded um, my, my coverage beyond just tribal issues in the United States. I began looking at the legal and political histories of tribes or native peoples in Canada, in Australia, New Zealand, um, and sort of brought all of those together to uh, help my students know that um, native peoples of other parts of the world had very similar experiences to what uh, native peoples have here. And the reason I find that so interesting is when you do a comparison between, well, how are they trying to deal with issues like protecting their homelands or their language or their way of life or, or their um, access to education and, um, you know, voting, participating in the, the affairs mm -hmm. of the state. All of those have parallels here in the U.S. So it gives us a window into seeing how people deal with those issues. I also had a chance to live and work at other schools during those many years. So I lived and taught with my family. We moved to Australia several times where I lived and taught at universities uh, like Wollongong and Sydney, and Melbourne, uh, which is all in the East Coast of Australia and uh, gave uh, lectures and spent quite a bit of time in different parts of Europe. Uh, Vermont Law School had a partnership, still has a partnership with a, a law school in Northern Italy in a city called Trento. And so we've had the good fortune of moving there for usually about two weeks at a time where I taught comparative law of indigenous peoples and have Italian students now who are doing work in indigenous studies and still keep in touch. I get photos of their kids now and um, one of them is working on a PhD here in the US on indigenous rights. So she was very influenced by that, by that experience. Um, in fact, all three of them are working in indigenous rights in some way. Uh, and one has become quite an expert on Latin American indigenous rights, um, building on, on the work that she did in my class. Um, 
in 2008, I, I resigned from Vermont Law School to join the faculty at Dartmouth uh, in Native American Studies, and that's where I've been ever since. So Dartmouth um, created this program back in 72, so it's one of the oldest Native Studies programs in the U.S., um, maybe the second or third oldest in the United States after Minnesota, and so we've been around for a long time. I've known the faculty who've taught in it uh, all these years because I was a student learning from the very first faculty who helped start that program. Michael Doris was the founder and he was one of my mentors and teachers at, at Dartmouth back in the 70s. And so to come back and teach at the program that was so uh, helpful to me and, and uh, really was so powerful in its influence to, I guess you can say, help me find the path for what I want to do with my life's work, which is uh, anything to do with the history and future of Native people, including our people in Homa. So um, that has given me the opportunity to devote my scholarship um, to that field. I don't, uh, when I was a law professor, I taught criminal law and torts. Torts is, you know, civil liability. And, but I made it very clear to my colleagues I, uh, when I joined the faculty there, I said, but I don't plan to write anything in criminal law and tort law. There, the world has enough books and law review articles about those fields. What I plan to write on is anything to do with native peoples. And they said, that's fine. That's, that's, a, that's an important area. So they gave me the latitude to be able to just focus all of my scholarship on on uh, legal and policy matters that relate to tribes. And so that has given me a chance to stay connected with people back home. And I would say the issue that has, um, that I've worked on the longest uh, from my earliest years as a lawyer uh, was the issue of federal recognition. So I, I know we'll talk more about that, um, but um, that's, the, that's been the major legal and policy uh, area that I've devoted most of my time with. And there's been a few other things, the folklore collection and things like that, um, but we'll get to that down the road. So that's a long-winded way of saying, um, you know, it's been a wonderful ride. I never saw myself going into teaching, um, but then again, I never saw myself going into law or school administration or anything like that. When I was Growing up in Dulac, honestly, my my um, the 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 plan that I had for the longest was to be a priest, um, Catholic priest, because I you know raised in a Catholic church and I was very devoted, dedicated to the church. And so um, when I was still in high school, junior, uh, right up till the time I left to go to Dartmouth, I was in touch with the bishop uh, back in New Orleans at the time. I was in correspondence with them about entering the seminary and then being assigned to work in somewhere in the bayous until I got accepted to Dartmouth. And then I decided, well, I'll go to college and then I'll go to seminary, uh, which was one of the reasons I majored in religion. So when I went to Dartmouth, I, I studied religion. That was my major. And then I, I uh, got a certificate in Native American studies. But I decided against being a priest uh, while I was in college. And, uh, and shortly after that, got married. So I, my wife and I got married very young uh, in 1979. So we've been married over 40 years. And uh, her sister and I were classmates. So that's how I met my wife, who's uh, Ojibwe, uh, um, from one of the bands of Ojibwe uh, natives from Michigan. And uh, so she's joined with me and my family in Louisiana has, um, you know, taken her in. And she actually helped me with that folklore project. We were still and had uh, were engaged, but had not been married when we did that oral history project back in 1978. So I'll stop Can there. Can you tell me a little bit more about, um, you mentioned Dulac and growing up there. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up there as a kid? Sure. Um, and just kind of get a feel for, set the scene. What was, what was your childhood like growing up in Dulac at that time? Yeah, so um, my folks divorced when we were very young, and so we were um, um, we were never homeless, but we we, ne we didn't have a home. We were always bouncing around to different uh, homes. Relatives took us in, 
There was a stretch where my mom worked in Grand Isle uh, as a cleaning lady. Uh, they, back then, Grand Isle had uh, little, these little, um, they call them camps, but they were like small houses that people could rent so they could have access to the beach. And um, so we lived in one of those little houses and my mom was the cleaning lady. And my brother and I would help her take the sheets and the, uh, all of that and put them on the big laundry truck every day. And um, when it was time to start school, we moved back to Dulac because this is still in the era of segregation. And so um, Indians still could not go to public school with whites uh, or blacks. They, there was a um, three different public school systems in Terrebonne Parish. Uh, one for blacks, one for whites, one for Indians. And in the 50s, the parish built the Dulac Indian School. Um, and that's where my brother and I went to elementary school from kindergarten to fifth grade. Um, we, when we moved back to Dulac, we moved in with my grandfather, my mom's dad, um, and he helped raise us, gave us a home. And that was my our home until I went to Dartmouth in 1976. So he was a wonderful provider. And, um, you know, we never um, appreciated until we got older how atypical our nuclear family was because my mom worked in a shrimp factory uh, all those years. So she would have these, you know, crazy hours, long, long hours in the shrimp factory. Uh, so she would leave, you know, before it was light. And sometimes not get back till it was dark um, during the, the, the height of the shrimp season, during the May season and the August season when it was busiest. And then our grandfather who kept remaking himself, he had, Papa never had a day of, of, never had a day of formal education in his life. So he was functionally illiterate, but he was one of the smartest people I've ever known because he not only raised a family of 10 as a single dad because his wife died giving birth to the youngest son, the youngest child. Um, but he kept remaking himself. You know, he was a shrimper, a trapper, and then he was a carpenter, a self-taught carpenter. And that's what he did for the bulk of the time that he raised us. And um, the good fortune behind that was it gave him uh, flexibility with his schedule. So he could make sure that we were off to school in the morning and then finished his work when we got home in the afternoon so he could start supper. So when I say atypical, you know, we got, we were raised with the idea that a woman can and does work outside of the home and a man can stay home and cook and clean and do all of those things. So my brother and I both developed, you know, we, we, we work very hard, but we also, I think are very good cooks and are very devoted to a clean household. So we're, we're good housekeepers as well because we got the, the full, the full treatment that there's nothing like this is woman's work. This is a man's work. It's like, no, you, you do what you need to do to support your family. And I, we saw that with my mom and my grandfather, you did, they did what they needed to do to support us. And um, it was very loving. You know, they were, we were poor, uh, like most of my relatives, very, very poor, but we, we didn't feel poor. You know, it was like, we always had enough to eat. It was one of those things where uh, as we got older, we knew when like my mom and my grandfather would always, um, like after we'd eat and serve ourselves the meal, they would say, oh, they were too full to have seconds. But we knew that they were just saying that so my brother and I would have more. Yeah. Very, very uh, loving. Yeah, it seems like um, your grandpa really played a big role in your life and was a great example to you and your brother growing up. Oh, huge. Both of them. Huge influence. So I've ended up writing about both of them uh, in some mm -hmm. essays that uh, hopefully people can read where I talk about my upbringing in Dulac and all of those lessons about living life well, I dedicated uh, an essay to my grandfather about living life in what I called uh, a posture of humility. And uh, humility to me um, never meant, you know, weakness or, you know, sub being subordinate. You know, it's not accepting that you're a less than. What to me humility means is you're, you're open. You acknowledge that you don't know it all and, you sh and no one can know it all. 
And so if you stay open to listen, it makes you more, um, uh, it opens up the channels between you and other people. So you can say, well, tell me about your life and your, what you want for yourself and your children. And you just listen, you know? And so humility in that sense is an, a sense of openness and an acknowledgement that you don't have all the answers and you need other people to help fill in those gaps. And so it, it forces us to maintain connection because we are, you know, we, we are dependent on each other. Nobody lives uh, as an island. Well, some people do, but they're not very happy, I don't think, because you're not. Well, it seems like you grew up with a really tight-knit sense of community. Exactly. And how did that, did that give you a sense of, of place and belonging? How did that affect and shape the way that you viewed the world as a young man? Yeah, it always, uh, it was huge because I always knew who my people were, um, you know, no matter how far I traveled or how long I stayed away, whenever I came to Dulac and saw my cousins, my aunties, my uncles, all of my relatives, uh, it, it was, it was, it was like a homecoming all over again. And um, because they knew that I had never forgotten who I was and who they were and what they meant to me. And so that sense of connection was, for me, it was like the lifeblood. You know, in other words, the, the actual blood that runs through my, my system is um, part of my biology. But in terms of what makes, uh, gives all of that meaning, you know, so that I don't feel unhappy, that I feel I know who I am, I know who has my back all the time. Um, is rooted in Louisiana. And that's why I say I live in Vermont, but my home is always Louisiana and always in the bayous because that's where I develop my sense of, um, of identity. You know, when, I, when I'm back home in Dulac and you, I go through all the places we used to work, play as children, you know, I see the beautiful marsh behind you there. And that was our... <laughs> That was a playground. That was, you know, you could have, you could use your imagination. I know some people would come and visit, you know, if they're outsiders and would come and they'd say, oh man, this, this feels like the end of the world. And, you know, it's like, who could possibly live here? And I remember as a kid, it was like, who would live, who would want to live anywhere else? <laughs> because you always had food and you always had relatives and you always had friends to kind of keep you company and uh, being part of that extended family where you always had child care, you always had elder care, you always had people sharing food. Like if someone had gone hunting and had a particularly good, you know, they had a lot of extra ducks or pooldoos or had gone shrimping. And so people were always sharing and said, I'm going to bring you some shrimp or I'll bring you some crab. And this is where living with Pepa, what my grandfather was so uh, special because he was a very uh, respected, um, you know, older person, an elder in our communities, uh, a lot of kids and relatives. So people would, would bring him food, which would, you know, it was a nice thing for sharing. So we always had, um, we always had food. So even though I said, if you looked at it from a purely economic standpoint, like how much money comes into the household, well, it was not much, it, you know, so, so from that perspective, we were very poor, but, you know, we always, because people shared and they took care of each other. So that's my, that was my upbringing. Um, even mm -hmm. though I knew that there were family members who dealt with alcoholism, dealt with um, really tough circumstances, you, you knew who was going through some rough times. We went through some rough times, you know, and everyone did. Um, but you also knew you could pull together and count on people. You needed a ride to town. You know, we didn't have a, a car. Uh, we never had a car the whole time I grew up in Dulac. So we were always dependent on uh, relatives to bring us uh, to town. I, I, I wrote about this, but one of my favorite memories was taking the bus, the big red bus, from Dulac to Homa. So, you know, back in that day, going to Homa was a huge deal because that was the city. And there were two departure times. There was the morning bus and the noon bus. And it would park near the courthouse, right downtown Terrebonne Parish, drop you off there and pick you up there as well. 
and it was right across the street from Haydell's Drugstore, or what used to be Haydell's Drugstore. I don't think it's there anymore. But um, the, after we do some shopping or whatever the, the work was, you know, going to the dent, do, doctor or shopping or whatever we needed to do, Pipa would treat us to a hot dog, a chili dog at Haydell's for 25 cents, you'd get the best hot dog. And it was just such a, a neat trick, uh, a treat for us. But um, we noticed that when you were on the bus, that the bus was a was kind of like a, a snapshot of the community because um, black people sat in the back because this was still segregation. White people sat in the front and Indians were sort of like in the middle. <laughs> it was just a really interesting kind of like, um, you know, uh, as I say, a snapshot of the community in terms of race relations that um, I, I didn't al always pay attention to, but I was reminded of that because I knew where we went to school, which friends we were allowed to have or not to have, uh, whose house you could visit or not visit, um, all of those kinds of things. So I, I knew um, that we lived in a very uh, racialized, um, you know, people paid attention to race. So who's your family? Where do you live? And all of that. Um, I, I learned that lesson very early. And I could also... I, language may have kind of played a role in this or helped craft a sense of identity. Was that part also of your everyday? Absolutely, because we only spoke French in a household. Uh, when I started, when my brother and I started school, um, a kindergarten, we, we really didn't speak English that well. We, we learned what I used to call Bugs Bunny English because we would watch cartoons. So we, we knew some phrases and we could kind of follow, we could follow English fairly well, but it seemed unnatural to speak it because everyone in our family, everyone in the family spoke French. And um, so that's the only language uh, that we learned growing up. And so uh, starting school was the start of being bilingual and, um, you know, we would catch each other making mistake and of course you're kids so you, you make fun of each other the way that you structure a sentence together and because um, we're all learning, we're all learning how to speak English and, uh, but in the household it was always French and with Pepa it was always French. I, I may have heard Pepa speak English twice in my entire life and he passed away in 1979 and um and one of those times was in town in a shop and other times it was someone stopping for directions and he answered the person in english and my cousin and i looked at each other like stunned that we heard <laughs> papa speak english for the first time and he, my cousin looked at me and said i didn't know papa spoke english i said neither did i <laughs> So it seems like it was with outsiders that English was used more often. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to move us into kind of talking a little bit more about um, once you moved out of Zulac and kind of began charting your path, um, where that took you and why you chose to pursue higher education, what your motivation was, and um, what your goals and aspirations were when you left Zulac and all these things that you have described to me sound so lovely. So. Um, you must have had something in you that was really driving you to um, achieve something different or to pursue a different path. So I'm just curious to know um, what led you to a different path. Yeah, so I, I think it, it boils down to, to two words um, for me. It's social justice. And I never heard those words until I came to Dartmouth. I just knew that I wanted, I grew up recognizing that um, you know, we were often, as a people, we were on the outside of things. You know, you have to sit in a certain section of the church. You have to sit on a certain section of the bus. You know, so I, I grew up knowing that this little community that we were in, there were rules for who's at the top and who's at the bottom. And those made no sense to me, right? It just seemed to me unfair. It's like, why can't I sit wherever I want to sit? Um, we all of us should be able to have access to everything else that people, you know, just by being people, but regardless of what color you are, what gender you are, 
um, we should all be able to move around in the world um, as equals. And religion played a big part in that because uh, in the Catholic Church, we would hear that God loves us all as you know, equals. We were all made in the image of God. And yet, I saw discrimination in the church. Um, my grandmother, my, my Pippa's wife, was the first Homa Indian to be buried in the cemetery behind, behind Holy Family Church. So there was even segregation after death. And so tell me that doesn't stay with a, ch a child when you grow up learning that even in a cemetery, being Indian, you still were not seen as equal to a white person. And so I, that, that, was, uh, that planted the, a, a major fire in me to find some way to work to redress that, to change that because I was very proud of being Indian. I was very proud of my culture. I was proud of being bilingual. You know, I know that there were some people who were made to feel ashamed of, of, of speaking French, you know, that they, they, they purposely did not teach their children how to speak French because they were punished for speaking um, French. And I was too. I got quite a few paddlings from the principal at Dulac School when, you know, we would answer uh, in French. That, we were still learning English. And so sometimes the first thing that came out was French. And um, so do like the Indian school was not always a happy place. For the most part, it was pretty happy. But so, so what stayed with me through uh, high school and led me to go to college was this desire to, to work, uh, to, to change things. And not just in in Dulac and Homa and in the bayous, but you know, I was learning about the experiences of other people in other parts of the world and just seeing other examples of social injustice. So it's like, well, it's not mm -hmm. just us. There's a lot of people, you know, and during the 60s, there was voting rights, there was protests. So um, this was the civil rights era. So obviously all of that was was filtering into my mind and my heart in terms of looking at ways that we have designed our society to work better for some people as opposed to others. And, and I wrote about this in one of my um, essays, and I used to teach this at, uh, at the law school during orientation. I would always ask my students to describe their first encounter with justice. And I would let them write a little, you know, tell me the first time that you experienced something that you became conscious of this concept called justice, you know, a sense of right and wrong. And I tell them that one of my first encounters with justice was after a hurricane, after Hurricane Betsy, coming back after we had evacuated to see what was left, because Betsy was a head on, hit us head on, you know, in, in Dulac in that area back in 1965. It was a very powerful hurricane. And when I came back, I remember that as we're driving back, along the bayou that um, you know, a lot of families had already gone back home early. They were taking stuff out of their houses and putting it on the side of the road for the, for the garbage collectors to come and pick up because everything was ruined. Furniture, appliances, carpeting, um, you know, everything that got messed up, damaged by the water was now on the side of the road. And I remember as a boy, it struck me, I was only seven years old or so, at the time, but I remember looking around as we made our way all the way down the bayou to Dulac, that it's like, hold on, everybody got hit. It's like I saw white families have to empty their houses and all their stuff is on the side of the road, black families and then Indian families. So it's like, God doesn't discriminate. It's like this was an equal opportunity destroyer. And it wasn't like, in the negative side of things. But as I grew older, what I began to think about was we were given a chance after this destruction, we were given a chance to rebuild our little society, you know, start over. You get a chance to do a do-over. And what did we do? We stayed with our segregated schools. The Indian school was still open for four more years. 
uh, although the integration had begun. It started in the high school and then middle school and then elementary school. But I didn't go to school with white kids and black kids until 1969. That's when they integrated the elementary schools and when I started sixth grade. So anyway, this idea of how people see each other, how people saw me, you know, sort of like, it almost doesn't matter how well I do if people see me as less than, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, well, you're an Indian, you know, you don't matter, you don't count. I knew that I mattered to my people, to my family. So, you know, if I didn't have that, and if I look at young, today's young people and say, if you, if you're missing that sense of belonging, like who are your relatives? You're going to have a hard time in life because, you know, life is going to throw a lot of stuff at you. And you need to have a firm foundation of who you are because you're going to get you're going you're going to get a lot of stuff thrown at you. And I did. I had a lot of stuff thrown at me, but I always could fall back on that foundation that I knew who I was. I knew who loved me, um, and I could take it. You know, it's like I never ever doubted that I had who I was. I didn't care what other people thought. You know, it's like, well, you don't look Indian. You're, you're light skinned. Uh, how could you possibly be Indian? It's like, I don't care if you don't see me as an Indian. I know a whole bunch of people back down to Bayou who know exactly who I am. So that's your problem. That's not my problem. And so I can't tell you how powerful that was to be able to go with that in your heart and say, now I'm going to go out into these areas. And when I got to Dartmouth, I was still planning to be a priest, but I, I had the great fortune to meet a young seminarian uh, who went to the church where, or who worked at the church where I, I attended. And he was, we became good friends and he was fascinated with my story. He was from Canada, so we spoke a little French together. And he um, asked me great questions about why did I want to be a priest? And I described exactly what I just shared with you, all the, and notice everything that I just shared with you had nothing to do really with, with religion or spirituality or a commitment to God or a call from God. I didn't get a calling. I thought I did. But um, so he asked me that. He says, after I shared all of that, he said, um, so what you really want to do with your life is pursue social justice. And I said, yes. Tell me what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I you have to frame it for you then is what, what happened. I said, I've never, I said, I've heard those two words, but I've never heard them put together. And I, so tell me what that means because it sounds right. And once he told me what that meant, I was like, yes. So I, so now I had a, a, a broad goal. Uh, I didn't have this, the concrete steps, like in what way am I going to address and pursue social justice. I just knew that that was my, my North Star. That's where I want to go. And so the priesthood was out because I met Hilda and we married uh, very young. And um, then law school became the alternative. Law school was plan B that I felt as a lawyer, I could use the force of law and civil rights and other kinds of things to um, try to bring about some change. And, and so that's what led me to go to law school and ultimately uh, made the way for me to a transition from being an advocate in the courts to being a teacher. Because like I said, I was able to make my way back to higher education as a school administrator, but also given the opportunity to teach uh, a course on the law and policy as it relates to native people, a body of law that's called federal Indian law, because it's mostly federal law about native people, including those that are not recognized by the tribe, by the federal government, like, like the HOMA. And once I, once I went into that direction, I, I felt I had found my calling. I felt that as an educator, as a teacher, as someone who could work with young people and help educate them about the way that our world sort of got to where we are and then leave them with the challenge to say, now it's your job to make it better. 
Um, we don't have to have things be this way. We don't have to be at each other's throats all the time and always be disagreeing. It's like, we're not gonna always have a, I'm not naive enough to think that we're all gonna have heaven on earth. It's like, that's, that's for later. I mean, we're all human. So as humans, we're gonna mess up. We're gonna get some things right but we're gonna, we're humans. We're, um, they're self-interest. We're gonna, we're gonna do those things that help us um, first. And it's, it's, I think it takes a special person to look beyond themselves and their self-interest to say, but what about other people? I know this works for me. And here's a, maybe a, a controversial, uh, but I'll put it in, in South Louisiana terms. And, you know, a lot of our relatives work in the oil and gas industry uh, because that's where the jobs are and the good paying jobs. And, uh, but most of our people grew up as uh, shrimpers and trappers and hunters. And the oil economy has had a devastating impact on those livelihoods. Just look at the environmental devastation that has, that has happened there. Self-interest would say, well, at least I have a job and I put money on the table, put food on the table for my family. And that's exactly right. But, but at what price, what is it, what is it doing to that area, to that place you called your home? Um, what if everybody approached things in that way, you'd use up your natural resources very quickly um, so that the air you breathe, the water you drink, the land that you farm in, get your food from isn't useful anymore. And um, so self-interest can only take us so far, you know, so, yeah. so for me, that's where humility comes in to say, I get it. I owe my family some support and this is the best way that I have, maybe the only way I have to support them. Um, it takes a special effort to look beyond that and say, but is that good for the world? Is that good for this environment? So another as I've learned from indigenous peoples all around the world, one of their foundational teachings is how we treat the natural world around us. You know, if you look at the water, you look at the ground, you, if you see it as a relative, like I'm related, this is my mother, this is my aunt, would we, would we do the same things? You know, would you see it as like, uh, the way some people who look at a forest and say, oh man, look at all that timber there. I can't wait to cut it all down and sell it, make a lot of money. But that's your relative. And that relative has done lots of things for you. That relative sucks out all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It provides an ecosystem for food that you, you know, for animals to survive on. So there's this relationship. So when we start forgetting our relationship, our place, and, and what, how we conduct ourselves, um, you, you, you kind of throw things off kilter. It's kind of like having a family member who throws a family off kilter. They're only thinking about themselves and they don't think about the relationships that it's like, well, if you take off, who's going to provide, you know, who's, who's, that leaves the rest of us to have to figure out how to do this. So I, 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 don't re, I don't do lawyer advocacy in the sense of representing people anymore. I, I long ago um, let my license in Louisiana go on what's called inactive status um, so that I don't have to, um, I don't go to court, <laughs> but I, my, my work has just shifted. So it's all about you know, writing and being a teacher and an educator and even a filmmaker, I, I, I've, I've produced several films that I never thought I would do. I, I don't see myself as a filmmaker. I've actually served as a producer for several films. The most recent one is um, a film called Dawnland, which I made with uh, uh, two young directors down in Boston. And it deals with um, the Indian child welfare system where the state social workers would come in and, and, and essentially take Indian kids away because they think they're not being properly cared for, even in instances where there's no evidence of abuse or neglect. And this is, you know, so if you look at it state by state, the, the rate of Indian children, the Indian children are 
are disproportionately represented in the in the child welfare system. In, in states like Minnesota, it's over 20 times the state average that uh, if you look at all the kids in foster care, the, uh, the majority of them are, are probably Indian kids. And uh, that's not because the Indian parents are abusing or neglecting their kids, it's because there's something else going on there in terms of, and, and sure enough, when we look at the history, which is what the film does, the film looks at the history that led to those policies where there was a definite history beginning in the late 19th century, where the federal government started creating boarding schools where Indian children were sent oftentimes thousands of miles away from their reservations. And they were sent with the goal of, of making them not Indian. In other words, mm -hmm. they were punished, punished for speaking their language, punished for practicing their spirituality. And the goal was to cut, cut the cord between them and their community. So everything that I just described about me and my connections to my community, those schools were designed to cut that connection so that the kids would see themselves as white or as at least not Indian. And that continued into the 20th century. In the, in the 1950s, the government shifted um, uh, uh, a bit and, and started encouraging natives to leave the reservations to go into urban areas. So this was the, it was called a government um, relocation program. And again, that was just another way to cut people's connections to their, um, to their uh, tribal uh, cultural ties. And in the 50s, there was also a thing called the Federal Adoption Project. And it was to encourage white families to adopt Indian kids for the same purpose. And that purpose was to basically assimilate them, to make them feel and grow up as white and not as Indian. So the whole goal was to kind of eliminate, um, you know, the, the sense of an Indian presence in the United States. So when you look at child welfare policies, they were reflecting that federal policy. And this is what the film gets, gets into. Uh, it focuses on the state of Maine, which is where the, the film is centered, but it, it, it tells a broader story about uh, this, this national phenomenon. And really- so it, Apart from your work in academia, you've also branched out into film and some other things. I'm curious to know, because you've covered a vast array of different um, interest and just your path is taking you lot, down lots of different places. Um, what do you consider your your proudest moment, not only personally but professionally? Um, for me, it's um, the working with um, young people. My so teaching and the influence that teachers can have on young people. Um, nothing comes close to that uh, because I see their work when I get letters from them or emails or uh, what they've done with their lives and they will, you know, send a note or something like that and say, you were the one that put me on that path. You know, you opened my eyes to make me believe in myself when it seemed like nobody else really believed in me, gave me that confidence to find my voice, to say, it doesn't matter where you come from. You, you came from a, a community that was poor, you were an outcast, you, your parents maybe didn't teach you the native language, whatever that, that um, how you may have been set back. I've gotten to work with young people who found their voice and found their, their mission and, and have been really wonderful in, in staying in touch to share that with me. Uh, and I, I, I encourage that because I bring many of those students back, or former students, I bring them back to Dartmouth as, as visiting lecturers. So they come back to today's young people, you know, my 18, 19, 20, 21-year-old college students, and they're hearing from someone I taught 25 years ago who's now uh, a tribal leader or a teacher or a doctor or a business person, or, you know, there were several of them who were prominent uh, cabinet officials. Uh, two of my former students um, were the, um, served as um, chairman of the National Indian Gaming Commission. That's the federal body that oversees all of casino gambling in the United States, which is a $30 billion industry 
well, two of my former students were appointed by the president, one by Obama and the current guy by President Trump. Um, both of those guys were my former students. I taught them when they were 18 and 19 years old. And so that's what I'm most proud of is the legacy of teaching and your influence on people and the potential that that teachers have. So I'm a I'm a big fan of teachers. I think about the educators that I've had and the kind of influence um, they've had on me, mostly positive. I do have some teachers in my mind that it's like, I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's your example of what not to do. Yeah, but that's, well, that's um, Apart from the work that doesn't necessarily have um, your name attached to it. It's these experiences and interactions that enrich someone's life and let them to yeah. find their purpose. Um, when it comes to your writing and the things that you've published, what are your hopes for what that could be used for someday? Or um, the film that you were part of producing, what's your hope that um, maybe that could be some sort of a legacy that you leave behind? Yeah, so so two things. One is I hope um, the I whenever I write anything, I hope that I'm building someone's knowledge. It's like, oh, if you read something that I've written, I I hope one reaction is, huh, I never knew that. That's interesting. It's like that that might cause me to rethink my 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 thinking on a certain issue because this is uh, this is really interesting. And the second thing is I hope it inspires people to say or to ask themselves, so what are you going to do about it? You know, here's I've set the table. Now, what are you, what are you going to do about it? It's like um, when you watch a really powerful film, a movie that really hits you, not just here, but in your heart. And you think, I can't see that issue the same way anymore. I, I can't see that person in the same way anymore because now my eyes have been opened, my heart's been open. Um, for those who profess being Christians, it's like this is what it sounds like to have one of those moments where you're looking at someone else the way God looks at someone. This is where I still feel like there's a bit of a priest in, in me is to say, start acting like the Christian you profess to be. Be open. Are you, or are you judging people? Are you doing exactly what the Bible teaches us not to do? I don't want to get preachy with people, so I use knowledge, I use education to say, here's what you got. Here's what I can offer you. Here's what I know. And I'm still learning. This stuff that I'm sharing with you, I might have just learned in the last five years. I certainly didn't know that 25, 30 years ago. I don't have all the answers. That's where the humility comes in. When I don't know things, I put it in my writing. I say, this is for somebody else to cover. You know, there's policy stuff that's over my head. Or I'm not, maybe I'm not interested in it. Or I try to stay focused. And so, so that's what I hope to do. I hope to enlarge someone's knowledge and then inspire them to take some action, do something about it. That's what I hope can happen. I know in, in your essay, um, I Am Where I Come From, you say that for every narrative of domination, abuse, and violation, there was and is an indigenous counter narrative of resilience, resistance, and resolve. And so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on what you think our tribe's counter narrative is and what, how is our tribe's future unique? How is it similar or inter interconnected with the destiny of other Native peoples? What do you foresee being the United Home and Nation's future? No, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I don't know our future. Um, I, I do know because I've lived it and heard it, uh, a, a lot of counter narratives, starting with the fact that we grew up speaking in my family, in our area, grew up speaking French but didn't identify as French people, you know, uh, very different than the Acadians, the Cajuns who have ancestry tracing from um, the folks who the British tossed out of Nova Scotia and many of them made their way to South Central Louisiana speaking their version of French. And uh, so even though we were speaking the language of a colonizer, you know, other parts of the world it was Spanish and other parts of the world it was English. 
our part of the world was colonized by the French. And you see the influence of that, you know, with uh, French language, with the powerful presence of the Catholic Church, uh, Louisiana using parishes, everywhere else in the U.S. it's counties. That all reflects the, the heavy French and Catholic influence. And yet our sense of identity as an Indian people, even though we're all mixed blood, you know, um, uh, with French ancestry and over the years, different kinds of, of uh, influences have come into our community is this sense of uh, knowing who you are. There are little local stories of resistance. So that's a kind of broad uh, resistance is the fact that you can have that much colonial influence in an area and still have a population of, of indigenous peoples seeing themselves as indigenous people. Now it helped in a negative way where the, the dominant society, the white society treated us differently, separate schools, separate sections, separate transportation, all of those things uh, help in a way to create boundaries so that people know who's an insider, who's an outsider to that particular community. Even though you're all living on a Bayou community, people know when you're driving through a white section, a black section, or an Indian section, right? Now it's a little bit more intermixed, but uh, back growing up, you, you knew which sections you were in, you could tell by someone's last name often uh, what, what uh, group that they were from, what social and racial group they were from. Um, but in terms of looking at our future, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, we have, there is, um, we're, we're much larger as a people. We're more spread out. Uh, not everyone is in Terrebonne or Lafouche Parish. So, so we have this, uh, the fancy word is diaspora, but it's, you know, it's just when people spread out, you know, you move because of jobs or education or marriage, you know, we'll take people away for different reasons. Some people come back, some people stay away. Some people choose to stay connected as I have uh, with my work and my family. Others have kind of severed the cord for their own personal reasons. Um, do, will we still have a HOMA community in, in 50 years from now? I don't know. Uh, I'd like to think we will. I'd like to think we are, we're, we're that strong and, and uh, uh, that people still see it as important, you know, uh, and not as a way to, to, to um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, um, a, a salad perspective, not the gumbo perspective. You know, the gumbo perspective is everything gets thrown into the soup and it's all mixed in and everything kind of loses a certain kind of, a, a bit of its identity. Whereas the, the tossed salad, the tomato is still a tomato, the lettuce is, you know, everything is still, but it's, it's thrown together. Um, we, and it's, and the result is beautiful. You know, they're both delicious. Um, but, um, Will we see people losing a sense of identity as Homa? Yeah, that's that's been our history. People uh, sort of move out, you know, in terms of their sense of what matters to them. And for some people, being Indian is not one of those things that matters to them. And I can't, because I don't see the world that way. I just have to accept it. I don't um, I don't see it as my mission to say to someone, even a relative, you know, you need to identify as Indian because that's your people. It's like, no, that's your choice. That's your choice, uh, you know, at least at some level. Um, those who do and want to connect and stay connected, I hope there will be something for them to stay connected to. Because once we lose- I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just curious to pick your brain. What do you think that young people can be doing today to preserve Homa language, traditions, and customs so that there is something to go back to when you're, in, you're seeking identity in place? You, you do something like what you're doing, which is you're learning, you're educating yourself about your connections, your family. Um, who was my family? How far back can I take my family um, heritage? What do I know about my great, 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 
grandparents? Where did they come from? So step one is, is know your family, know your roots. Um, um, the language challenges are severe because we, we, um, we don't have any fluent native speakers to go to and say, am I pronouncing this right? You know, how do I string together uh, more than just an odd assortment of words, you know, and um, to build a, a, not just a vocabulary, but an actual language. So I know what you're up against, and I've got a lot of students at Dartmouth who have dedicated their lives to work as linguists. They have gone and, and, and gotten, gotten PhDs in linguistics so they can bring that tool that toolkit, add that to their toolkit and go back to their communities and, and do exactly this kind of work. But I think there's another big piece, Rochelle, is, is this connection to place. I think one of the things that, that I have found that indigenous peoples around the world really see as central to this sense of identity, even when they've lost language, is they've maintained connection to their their homeland. In other words, the place that they, their ancestors have always called home. And for us, it's South Central Louisiana that, you know, we were not in the place where when the French first arrived back in the late 1600s, early 1700s, we were where Baton Rouge is now. Uh, that's where the home of villages were located. And I don't know how many of our uh, viewers know this, but the, the name Baton Rouge comes, it means red sticks, but that's because they recorded seeing red sticks that were the dividing lines between the Homa homelands and a neighboring tribe. So they would refer to it as the place of the red, La Place de Baton Rouge, the place of the red sticks. Um, and that's where Baton Rouge gets its name uh, through a variety of motivations, sometimes voluntary, sometimes involuntary, there was this migration southward, um, uh, not as one whole, but a, a large contingent of Homa families settled in what is now uh, Terrebonne and Lafourche parishes. And most of us can trace our lineage to the families who, who resettled along the bayou. So I think for me, uh, retaining a sense of Homa identity also is going to entail maintaining some sense of connection to this place. Um, once that connection is gone, I'm not sure how you form an identity that is missing a lot of the cultural um, dimensions, language, spirituality, uh, traditional uh, storytelling. So when I grew up, for example, I was surrounded by storytellers. Everybody knew parts of our, of our collective stories. That's why my wife and I did that folklore collection, so that people could read those stories and either remember their own, you know, they, they must have been told similar stories. Everyone's got Lugaru stories. Everyone's got uh, Lutin stories. And so remembering those and sharing them with your children and your great grandkids and so forth is a way we keep some of these things alive and knowing who we are as a people. Now, whether the federal oh, government ever... Sorry, that was exactly where I was going. I wanted to ask you as a legal expert, um, how does federal recognition play a role in this in preserving or perhaps um, creating a sense of identity or or helping us um, just kind of have a direction as a tribe moving forward? Yeah, I, so so here's where and I'm a big uh, I've written a lot about, you know, uh, how to uh, I've critiqued that system as a legal system and, and the kinds of burdens that it puts on Native communities and uh, trying to seek it, uh, but I always put it in two different um, baskets. Um, the, the basket of cultural preservation, cultural continuity, continuing to be who you are as a people. Um, I, from my standpoint, federal recognition has nothing to do with that. We have to do that work. That's what a community does. There are a lot of other cultures around the world that do not have a claim to being a government, that they don't need their own government structure to preserve their language, their, their, their heritage, et cetera. Um, so people can grow up, you know, having a sense of identity as, you know, fill in the blank. 
Um, so we have to do that work on our own. What federal recognition, the second basket, what it affords is a structure, a governmental structure where those cultural values that we have preserved, or at least we hope we have preserved, will have a, an outlet. In other words, you take those values and it, you can channel it into the kinds of, of policies and practices that help keep your people together. So, um, but if that, if that first part isn't there, there's very little that a tribal government can do to put it there. And, and mm -hmm. think about it, you know, you can't, you can't have a federal government that's going to, or, or state government or, or a Terrebonne Parish municipal government order people to, to behave in a certain way. You know, it's like, you must all speak this language. Uh, there are some countries that do that, right? They insist that you have to do that. More often what happens is they create the conditions where those things that the people already want can take place. So you put, you put uh, protections in place. You maybe try to get funding in place. That's what a tribal government can do is to create the conditions where a certain way of life can continue. So if we had federal recognition, you know, the, 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 the tribal government would be in a position like tribal governments all over the US to play a part in supporting our elders, play a part in supporting language retention. So it becomes a vehicle. When you don't have that tribal government, you have to create your own structures. And you, you've done that, but you see how hard it is because you know, to do the work you do, you need to create, you know, have to find funding. Uh, you have to create a structure, you have to sustain it. When you stop doing this, who's going to continue it? When you have a tribal government, there's a structure that stays once the people who run it uh, serve their term, someone else comes in. But in your work, it, someone's going to have to take, succeed you in doing what you're, you're currently doing. So it serves a vital role. Now, whether we will get it or not, uh, I don't know. You know, it's, it's very hard in this day and age, and given the, 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 the factionalism that, in, that exists in our community, that so we have um, uh, different communities that identify as a different uh, people, uh, that complicates things for everybody uh, who, who pursues federal recognition. So we have to come to grips with that. We have to, we have to reconcile that in some way because we all have a common history. I know because I've helped write that history. So, so I know where people kind of come from uh, and what the historical record will support and what it won't support. Um, and so given the factionalism, frankly, we have given the federal government a pass. Uh, the government can kind of look at us and say, well, if, if y'all don't know who you are, we're, we're going to just hold off until you get that all straightened out and then y'all can come. But until that's resolved, there's nothing in it for the federal government. They're not going to recognize one community and not recognize everybody else. So it's it's gonna. There has to be some sort of logic behind that. And right now, it really lies with us. <laughs> it, does. it does. So um, yeah. So that I think we have to um, sort of find a way to to come together and talk honestly about. Uh, and I and I know some of the reasons why there was that factionalism. It's very detailed, very complicated. Uh, I think it it originates from a misreading of what the government told us back in 1994 when it told us uh, gave us a preliminary finding. Um, the government was just misreading the historical record. They were just wrong. They ignored a lot of the documentary record that our tribe produced, and so. So what, what do you do now when, the, when you have evidence that the government misread your own history? They didn't listen at all to the oral tradition, which was a big part of the records that we established in, uh, in, in uh, the, the petition that I helped write. Um, so I, uh, we've got our work cut out for us. So there's a bit of it that's internal, and then there's a bit of it that is correcting the mistakes that happened uh, in 1994 that I think led to some of that um, factionalism. Okay, thank you for that background. I think that's important for people to understand and kind of get a big picture and also just relate it back to what we as a people have to be doing on our on our own terms 
no. um, regardless of what the federal government does or does not do. So no. thank you. Um, just to kind of wind things down, um, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you for, for um, just being so honest and willing to, to share with us a little, a little bit about you and your motivations and where you come from. Um, I'm curious to know if someone is interested in reading your work or um, kind of learning more about the things that you've published and the films that you've been a part of producing, where can they go to find your work? So um, a lot of it is published in uh, law journals um, and um, some of it is so I've, I've done three books. I've written two books and edited a third, and those are available on Amazon. <laughs> um, so you can just order those books there. The articles are a little harder just because um, you, you probably will have to use a library to help uh, if they subscribe to the journals. Um, the journals uh, require some sort of an act you know you have to have a license and um, subscriptions and things like that so that might be a little harder to access but people can always write to me I can always send them a PDF copy um, of my work and in fact um, uh, I, I have most of my work in PDF fashion so I will send you uh, additional I, I sent you the stuff that I published that relates to our people but I'll send you some of the other stuff that doesn't necessarily, although some, some of my work does have little stories or something like that that relates to something that happened here. So I'll send you a lot of that, that you, as a PDF so you can load it onto the website to make it as accessible. Um, the books themselves, people will just have to order the books. And, and um, uh, I haven't, you know, the books are old. I mean, one was published in 2008. The other one was 2000 and, uh, 13, I think. Um, I've, I've not made a penny on either of those books because, uh, you know, they're academic books. And so it's not like writing a novel where hundreds of thousands of people might buy your book and, and read it or make it into a movie. Academics don't publish books to make money. So most, most of us don't make money on our books. Um, I, uh, I did get advances, uh, you know, to, to get started on the project to support my work while I was working on it, but that's about it. So, uh, um, but I'm, I'm happy that people are buying it. It's in a lot of libraries. So uh, I don't know if either of my books are in your local libraries, but most universities, university libraries have both of my books uh, and the edited volume that I did. And most of them have a copy of the film. Uh, so, um, the Dawnland is actually going to be screened on Indigenous Peoples Day, October 12th, uh, free. So I'll send you the link um, that people can uh, see the film for themselves. Um, I think there are, it's in two versions. There's the short and the long version. Um, the shorter version is uh, 55 minutes or something like that. We had to edit um, the film down for when it was televised on, on PBS. Uh, and then the longer version is 80, um, 85 or 86 minutes. Uh, I think the shorter version is just as powerful as the longer version. And um, very proud last year, September, the film was uh, presented an Emmy Award for Outstanding Research. So that was a real nice uh, tribute to the, the whole team uh, to get an Emmy Award for, for that work. So uh, it's still doing very well. It's getting a lot of of attention. Some other states are looking at it carefully to look at their uh, child welfare policy. So it is having that kind of uh, effect that I described, which is uh, providing information and forcing people to ask good questions like, now what do we do about it? Uh, we, can't, exactly. we can't just keep you know, business as usual. Well, thank you so much for, for again, for your time and for taking us a little on, along your social justice journey <laughs> and your quest for social justice. Yeah, um, it's been a pleasure and um, I look forward to seeing more about your film and, and um, also receiving the information about the other published work so that we can continue to learn more through you. Thank you. Thank you very much and good luck if you're ever visiting in New England. Look us up. I sure will. <laughs> Atlanta goes for you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Say hi to your family. I will. Bye. Bye.